Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is John Brook. I am a historian of science with particular interests in the relationship between science and religion. I was privileged to be the first occupant of the Andreas Idrios Professorship of Science and Religion in Oxford University. And I've had contacts over the years, particularly <coughs> with the universities of Lancaster and Durham. It's my privilege to chair this first session this morning, which falls into two parts. We are privileged to hear Michael Velke and John Polkinghorne first, and then at the halfway stage, I shall invite Jeffrey Schloss to talk about his work on evolutionary biology and the spirit. We shall have the question and answer session after both of the presentations. So may I invite you, John, to begin? Thanks. Well, I suppose to describe ourselves, I'm professionally a, a theoretical particle physicist, but I'm also an Anglican priest. And so for 25 years, I've been very interested in the relationship between science and religion. <coughs> now, topics in eschatology made a rather late appearance in the modern form of the dialogue between science and religion. The initial stages tended to concentrate on topics <coughs> that you could allocate to the, either to a theology of nature or natural theology. But eschatology, I think, is a very important <coughs> part of the dialogue, and it is a part of the dialogue that is absolutely, intrinsically interdisciplinary in its character. First of all, there is the contribution of science. Science really raises the challenge uh, about eschatological hopes. Every story that science tells, in the end, ends in decay and futility. Essentially, that is due to the second law of thermodynamics, which says that without inter external interference, systems get progressively more disorderly as time goes by. The reason for that is simply statistical. There are many, many more ways of being disorderly than there are of being orderly. And so the waters of chaos just inexorably rise. We know that we're going to die on a time scale of tens of years, essentially because of this. And we also know, the cosmologists uh, assure us, that the universe itself is going to die, obviously on a rather longer time scale, of many tens of billions of years. But ultimately, it too is condemned to death and futility, most probably by continuing to expand, becoming progressively more and more cold, more and more dilute, more and more approaching the total disorder of thermodynamic equilibrium. And that's the challenge. And we, have to, that, those, we have to take those insights of science absolutely seriously. That is the, chi the challenge that science presents to theology. The theology claims that the universe is a meaningful creation of the divine creator. If in the end it's all going to end in the rather miserable way I've been trying to describe, doesn't that challenge that, 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 that assertion? The, the world may look very fruitful and orderly today, but in the end, isn't it going to turn out to be not a cosmos, but a chaos? Well, that's the story that science has to tell, I and mean, we have to take that story absolutely seriously. But it's not the only story to tell. Science tells essentially what you might call the horizontal story of the unfolding of present process. But theology has a different story to tell, what you might call a vertical story, a story of the faithfulness of the creator. Can we close the door, maybe? Oh, close the window, then. The window? No? OK. Well, noise is all for part of life, I'm afraid. Um, Theology has a different story to tell, the story of divine faithfulness. And, that, 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 and, that, and that, that, that story has to be taken into account also. We have no natural expectation, that by that I mean an expectation that science could articulate, of a destiny beyond death. But I think we have every theological or religious expectation of a, of a destiny beyond death because of the faithfulness of God. Christian theology has never tried to pretend that death is not a reality. But it does claim that death is not the ultimate reality, because only God 
is ultimate. And of course, that was a point that's made in, 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 in the Gospels, in Jesus' celebrated dialogue with the Sadducees, who also didn't believe the destiny beyond death. And Jesus said, reminded them that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he said to them, trenchantly, and I think with, with great challenge, the God not of the dead, but of the living. In other words, if the patriarchs mattered to God once, and for sure they did, then they will matter to the faithful God forever. And that is the contribution that theological insight provides the discussion of these eschatological issues. But there is a further issue that needs to be considered, and it is simply this. That may be all very well, but can we actually make sense of the notion of a human destiny beyond death, a destiny beyond the decay of the body? And when we start to think about that, we have to think about human nature, and that means that we need a third participant in the, in the conversation, which is called anthropology. And when you start to think about those issues, you very soon see that you have faced issues both of continuity and discontinuity. Continuity, it really has to be the patriarchs who live again in the kingdom of God, not just new characters given the old names for old time's sake, but really Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that means there has to be, if they claim is to be meaningful, some carrier of continuity between life in this world, whatever life there may be, beyond death. And of, of course, in much Christian thinking, in fact all Christian thinking, I think we're prepared to say, has seen the human soul as being the carrier of continuity between life in this world and life in the world to come. But a great deal of, of Christian thinking has conceived of the soul in Platonic or, 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 or Cartesian forms as a sort of, in principle, detachable spiritual component housed within the fleshly husk of the body but released at death. And that sort of dualist picture of human nature has, I think, become very difficult indeed for us to embrace today. I think we, for all sorts of reasons that I didn't go into, we see human beings as being, so to speak, a package deal, as being psychosomatic unities. And if that's the case, have we lost the concept of the soul? And if we've lost the concept of the soul, have we lost the possibility of a carrier of continuity? I don't think so, but we have to reconceptualize the concept of the soul. It's interesting enough, actually, that this idea of human beings as psychosomatic unities would not have been at all strange to the uh, Hebrew writers of, 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 the, of, of the Old Testament. Uh, in a famous phrase, Hebrew thought saw, saw human beings not as, 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 um, so as, as, as embodied beings and not as incarnated souls. And, and um, so that this, this notion of, 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 um, of human unity in that sense uh, is, 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 is not foreign to, to, to scriptural thinking. But what, what, what is then the soul? What is the carrier of continuity? Well, I, I can't solve that problem in two minutes, but the soul is the real me, presumably. And it's almost as difficult to know what the real me is in this life as it might be beyond life. What makes me elderly, frail, academic, the same as the schoolboy with the shock of black hair of many years ago. At first sight, it seems to be material continuity, but that's an illusion, because as we know, the atoms of our bodies are changing all the time, so wear and tear, eating and drinking. I have very few that were there even a few years ago. I'm atomically distinct from that schoolboy, so it's not the matter as such. It's, and here I have to wave my hands very vigorously, but I hope in the right direction, it is the almost infinitely complex information-bearing pattern carried by that matter at any one time. My memories, my character, etc., etc., which is the real me. Now, I don't know how to characterize that pattern. I don't think anybody does, but that seems to me the direction in which to think, and it seems to me entirely credible to believe that the faithful God will not allow that pattern to be lost. It will, of course, to, as far as dissolve with the decay of my body, but God will not allow that pattern to be lost and will re-embody it in a great final act of resurrection. So that's the continuity side of things, but we also need to think of discontinuity. It's no good making Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob live again, simply in order to die again. So though our destiny, I think all human destiny, true human destiny is embodied destiny, it will have to be embodied in a new way. The matter of the new creation will have to be different from the matter of the old creation, of this creation. 
the matter of this creation, which is subject to this thermodynamic drift towards um, uh, decay. And I think it's perfectly credible, again, in a general sort of way, to believe that God could bring into being a new form of matter, so endowed with strong organizing, self-organizing principles that that, decay, that drift to decay no longer take place. So these are the issues. And the well, point I'm really making is that to tackle these issues in any realistic way, we need the insights of science, we need the insights of theology, and we need the insights of anthropology. So we need interdisciplinary work. Now, interdisciplinary work is hard work, and it doesn't happen overnight. That sort of fusion of insights doesn't take place just like that. But that's the theme I know that Michael is going to talk to us about.